Uh, and thank you to all of you who are attending here and online. Uh, I want to give a special thank you to the International Institute for Sustainable Development for hosting the Trade and Sustainability Hub and allowing us to participate. Uh, my name is Rachel Thrasher. I'm a legal researcher and the head of the Trade Policy Research at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. And we are excited to be able to join you today to explore the intersection of climate technology and intellectual property. We are going to ask specifically whether this relationship is a repeat of the access to medicines debate or something new. Uh, our co-sponsor is uh, the Center for Policy Dialogue, and uh, our first expert that we're join that we're that is joining us today, Famira Katun, is the executive director of the Center for Policy Dialogue, which is a leading think tank in Bangladesh and a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, a think tank based in the U.S. She also has served as co-chair of the T20, T20 India Task Force on Accelerating the SDGs, exploring new pathways to the 2030 Agenda. Um, Nagesh Kumar, to her left, uh, is the director and chief executive of the Institute for Studies in Industrial Development, which is a New Delhi-based, publicly funded policy think tank and a non-resident senior fellow at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. He was formerly director also at the UN uh, Economic and Social Commission of Asia and Pacific, UNESCAP, um, and held several senior positions, um, management roles there from 2009 to 2021. And to his left is, uh, we're joined by Anthony Taubman, currently the director of the Intellectual Property Division of the World Trade Organization, who has responsibility for the WTO's programs on intellectual property, competition policy, and government procurement. Prior to that, he was also director of the Global Intellectual Property Issues Division of the World Intellectual Property Organization. So after a brief introduction, we will get a chance to hear from these experts who will guide us through their perspectives on the climate technology needs of developing countries, what obstacles might exist in their pursuit of those technologies, and what role national governments, the World Trade Organization, and other international institutions can play to overcome those obstacles. So with those introductions, let me set the stage for our discussion. No one here is contesting the statement that climate change is an existential threat. And as has been heard many different, um, in many different panels here today, also an effective response will critically depend on the cost, performance, and availability of technologies that mitigate and help countries adapt to our changing climate. This will require a virtual revolution of technology. Now the good news, um, oh, I want to go back. The good news is that much of this is already happening. So technological innovation is making big strides. In 2021, the International Energy Agency released a roadmap to net zero by 2050. And in that report, they found that 50% of the emissions reductions needed to reach net zero relied on technology that was only in the prototype or demonstration phase. And as of 2023, that number was down to 35%. For those technologies that are now proven and able to be deployed, the challenge is to scale up in a way that promotes resilient, inclusive, and affordable transitions across countries. Now, while clean energy de deployment and scaling is happening very quickly in some areas, in China and in high-income countries, for emerging market and developing countries other than China, investment, public and private, in scaling up will need to increase by six-fold over the next 10 years. This will include gaining access to climate technologies and, at least in some cases, empowering firms in those countries to contribute to that scaling process. Now, governments are not unaware, have not been unaware, of the need for rapid, equitable technology transfer in developing countries. Indeed, it has been an aspect of climate commitment since the very first discussions in Rio in 1992. The need for technology transfer has been anticipated in the WTO TRIPS agreement, and of course in the Paris Agreement, Article 10 specifically notes this, and the countries have been invited to identify specific technologies that they need in order to meet their Paris commitments. Now, the, the theoretical way that intellectual property is supposed to work, and this is not going to be new information to any of you, is that it is to grant a temporary monopoly right in exchange for a publicly available knowledge of an innovation. Ultimately, this system is attempting to balance two interests, those of incentivizing innovation and promoting diffusion. However, um, it operates as a sort of seesaw. So to the extent that any particular instantiation of the system offers more incentive to one, it often slows down the other. How does this work on the ground? Do patent rights lead to more innovation and sufficient diffusion? First of all, 
The empirical evidence has shown, at least for high-income countries and many large middle-income countries, that strong patent protection is correlated with high technology imports, investment flows, and more and easier licensing of technology. However, as empirical studies have dug deeper, they find that the impact of patent protection and IP enforcement varies across country income levels, the type of technology, and the industries involved. Even more importantly, the newest studies have found that stronger IP laws and enforcement are not correlated with transfers of climate change mitigation technology, especially in low-income country, and for climate adaptation technology for the most vulnerable countries, there is little evidence of access of any kind, whether through trade, investment, licenses, or patent filings. So what does this mean for us? The research seems to support the idea that IP rights may promote innovation and diffusion, but only if the incentives are appropriately balanced for the specific technology, sector, and jurisdiction. Stronger IP protection in law does not on its own correlate with either greater indigenous innovation nor with indicators of diffusion, such as technology transfer in low and middle income countries. Finally, the theoretical literature suggests that IP protection, if it's poorly balanced, can act as a constraint on access to technology. So this literature is drawing on analogy from the access to medicines literature and argues that the global rules governing IP are not fit for purpose for the needs of low and middle income countries. So if global IP protection levels are not doing the job they're supposed to be doing, then national governments and innovation or technology ministries should value the rules differently. Instead of treating them as fundamental property rights, they could be viewed as a policy lever to be determined and potentially modified at the national level. This suggests at the multilateral level that the rightness and appropriateness of the current rules may not be a given for any particular country, for any particular technology or industry. Um, second, in order to test empirically whether stronger IP protection is an obstacle to access to climate technology, additional data and research is required. So current measures of technology transfer are plagued with methodological challenges, and, more climate, and as more and more climate technology is developed, there's going to be a growing need to improve these research methods to assess whether, in fact, IP um, or other potential obstacles are impeding access to that, that technology. So this is, it is this climate and intellectual property puzzle that brings us here today and to join a discussion with these experts, um, two from leading developing countries with a keen interest in climate technology, um, Famida and Nagesh, and as well as a longtime expert in the area of intellectual property and international institutions. Um, this, uh, just a brief note that this uh, QR code uh, will send you to the BU G GDP Center's uh, research, recent research on trade rules, access to medicines, and climate, um, and you can find uh, links to all of our research there. Let's start uh, with Famida here. Um, Famida, could you set the stage for us a little bit um, from your perspective? Can you tell us what would you say Bangladesh's primary climate goals are in terms of both mitigation and adaptation? And are there any obstacles to those goals? In particular, what kind of technology might, might be needed? Uh, thank you, Rachel, um, for those introductory remarks. And uh, thank you all for joining us here this um, afternoon. So as you have uh, set the stage, many of these issues are uh, relevant for Bangladesh very much because, as you know, that Bangladesh is a country which is disproportionately impacted by the climate change uh, related uh, disasters and uh, the emission by Bangladesh, greenhouse ga gas emission, is very low it's compared to the global uh, share. It's only 0.4 percent of the global greenhouse gas. And the economic damage of these uh, climate-related vulnerabilities is really huge. There are several numbers, many of you know, but just to give you one uh, number, according to the World Bank study recently, that uh, the annual loss because of the you know, various natural disasters like tropical cyclone, only from tropical cyclone, the per year loss is 1 billion US dollar, which is 0.7% of the GDP. So, um, but as uh, Bangladesh is at only at the recipient end, so 
so far, the policies and also measures um, focus mostly on the adaptation because it is also a country which is populous uh, in a small uh, area, 170 million people are you know, uh, living there. So any natural disasters have, um, will have much more impact compared to the other countries. So, however, Bangladesh also is concerned about the mitigation area, and it has recently um, adopted many policies which are towards mitigation. For example, the nationally determined commitment. So Bangladesh has made commitments both conditionally and unconditionally, meaning that without uh, international support, Bangladesh itself will reduce the um, carbon emission from various sources, for example, energy, agriculture, forest, land use, waste uh, management. And also, uh, with support, uh, Bangladesh is going to uh, increase its commitment towards reduction. So uh, without support, it's 5.7%, but with support, in addition to that, um, it's 6.7%. Uh, with support, it's 15.1% uh, uh, plus the uh, one. So you can see that there are goals both in the adaptation and mitigation areas. But however, the in terms of technology, both adaptation and mitigation activities require um, technological support. Just to name a few, in case of um, adaptation, <clears throat> the Bangladesh's technological needs assessment, that is TNA, that has highlighted two areas. One is agriculture, the other is water. These are the key sectors which require technological intervention. And in case of water subsector, adaptation technologies will include, for example, um, salt water intrusion barrier. You know that many some part of the um, country there is salt water, saline water intrusion, particularly you know towards the Sundarban areas. Then we have the sea level rise problem. Um, so the urban infrastructure also gets um, you know affected. So there are many others, so, and also to face the tidal uh, flu. So these are, there are many others, just to give you some examples that adaptation related technologies. So, but in case of the mitigation related technologies, we also need uh, many others which are a bit advanced in the sense because it's mostly energy related, energy sector related, for example, you know, natural gas mix cycle, solar um, house, uh, PV, like, photovoltaic, um, and also um, advanced combustion turbine, advanced natural gas combined terminals, and many others. But the problem is that in case of uh, you know, um, adaptation and mitigation technologies, the uh, investment is so high, so much of resources is required. Um, the, and also the, because of the you know, in pri the priorities, in the competing priorities, the government has to you know, juggle between allocating resources. So obviously it is not possible to um, you know, invest on technological um, adoption or dissemination by the public sector itself. So bringing the public private sector both from the national level and also international level. For example, the foreign direct investment, which is you know, important for that. Um, but however, unfortunately, foreign direct investment is only 1% of GDP, and most foreign FDI has gone to fossil fuel-based uh, you know, power plants so far. So this is a worry um, internationally also, but with the you know, global commitments, it has to you know, change, and it's going to change in the, at, the, at this moment in time. We are seeing that both from the government and also from the private sector, there are a lot of you know, interest, and of course from the other you know, um, countries, because Bangladesh is also integrated with the global economy through exports and also, I would stop here, maybe you can come later. Thank you. Thank you, Famida. That's incredibly helpful and I think sets a, a great stage for then Nagesh to talk about India's experience, which is going to have some similarities and some uh, distinctives as a larger middle-income country with a growing technology sector. Um, can you speak to your climate goals and some of the roles that technology might play? Mm -hmm. 
thank you, Rachel. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I think it's a very timely, uh, timely discussion, and uh, thank you for setting the stage very uh, well uh, with the key issues on the discussion right now. Now, coming to your question about India's climate goals, I think, like Bangladesh, India also has, uh, in terms of per capita levels, very low uh, emissions. Uh, but because it's a very large population base, uh, altogether cumulative, uh, you know, uh, emissions, uh, it becomes one of the largest uh, emitters. And it is uh, taking very uh, ambitious commitments to bring down the emissions. Although there is a net zero goal announced by the Prime Minister in the COP uh, of 2070, and which may sound very distant, uh, there is an intermediate uh, target of bringing down the emissions uh, by 2030 in terms of 50% of electricity generation uh, from renewable sources by 2030, reducing the emission intensity of, the, of its economy by 45%, and reducing a billion tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, so we have been working on uh, these uh, commitments uh, in right earnest and uh, very heavy emphasis is there on uh, clean energy transition, including through solar, wind, hi green hydrogen, and all other, uh, you know, bio, uh, sort of biofuels uh, also. And uh, Renewable energy uh, capacity, installed capacity, has expanded in the last nine, ten years by four times. So from 40 gigawatts to 180 gigawatts uh, in 2023. Uh, so between 2014 and 2023, from 40 gigawatts to 180 gigawatts. Now the target is 500 gigawatts by 2030. So we need to uh, g continue the same pace of, uh, you know, uh, accelerated expansion of, of the uh, renewable energy installed capacity. And, uh, uh, and so for that, there are national missions for national solar mission, for instance, national green hydrogen mission. There is a, a you know, a wind energy plan and uh, for transport sector, uh, we are working on uh, e-mobility policy and, uh, you know, energy efficiency, uh, all, all sectors of the economy, uh, clean industrial transition and the batteries and storage solutions are uh, being worked on. So, uh, and government has uh, followed a very proactive policy to uh, harness uh, the solar energy, for instance, through this national solar mission, which is very unique in many ways, uh, in the sense that uh, government has worked on a plan to uh, enter into long-term purchase uh, agreements, uh, PPAs, long-term purchase uh, agreements, uh, power, uh, power purchase agreements, with companies or producers of uh, solar energy at a fixed price. So there is a tender and quotation, and then for 20 years you uh, have assured market. This has uh, helped in expansion of capacity and brought down the prices. So today, uh, solar energy is very competitive vis-a-vis -vis thermal power. And so this is something of a big success. Now, future expansion of uh, the capacity that we have very ambitious goals will need huge expansion of, uh, you know, capacity to produce uh, these uh, equipment, solar, PV, cells, modules, and wafers uh, domestically. And this is very much the government uh, policy right now. There's a uh, production-linked incentives uh, you know, scheme through which the expansion of local uh, production is being uh, supported and incentivized. And so this capacity is coming up very quickly. Uh, then, uh, you know, uh, there is uh, also, uh, uh, you know, uh, similarly for other sectors or segments of, 
of energy. Uh, there are similar programs of expansion. But, uh, you know, uh, your second part of your question was uh, whether uh, technology will be an obstacle. I think it would be uh, because despite these very ambitious goals for renewable energy, uh, coal will continue to be a, an important source of energy for a, a foreseeable future, future for India because we can't replace ca coal completely. Or ca cannot uh, throw it out of the window because the uh, you know requirement uh, of uh, energy or uh, electricity is expanding in a very very uh, fast manner uh, per capita consumption of electricity is only 10th of united states and only 5th of china so it has to grow as with the growing prosperity and so coal will continue to be an important source uh, right now, 54%. Over time, it will be maybe 30%, but it will be there. And so that brings me to the question of uh, technologies which can help to use coal as a energy source, but use it in a manner which is not polluting, not, uh, you know, sort of uh, GHGs are reduced. And in that context, the, uh, you know, uh, the new technologies like uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage, you know, they are very helpful. And so uh, there are all kinds of uh, new technologies which, uh, you know, help you to reduce carbon footprints of uh, thermal energy generation. And so they need to be harnessed for that. And they are fortunately uh, available. And so the issue is of the affordable access. And that is where I think this discussion should go to. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Nagesh. Um, I think this demonstrates really well that there are different kinds of countries with different kinds of technology and climate adaptation and mitigation profiles countries that have um, really important entrenched fossil fuel sectors that they will need to manage and won't be able to phase out right away. And so new technologies for carbon capture and storage are, are going to be really important. We have countries that are experiencing extreme climate vulnerability and will will um, need to invest and need others to help them invest in a new climate technology for that. Um, and, I, and I want to then turn to um, Anthony um, and ask Anthony, up to this point, we've just been talking in generalities about technology, and I'd like you to um, tell us a little bit about the role um, of the intellectual property division in predominantly in plant, in supporting WTO members in their um, in their engagement with the TRIPS agreement, which is the as many of you probably know the agreement on trade related aspects of intellectual property, um, and just tell us briefly how the office interfaces with member states. Um, and if you could speak to the experience of Ecuador in 2013 and in, in their pursuit of um, TRIPS flexibilities for climate technology. C certainly. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. A, a real uh, pleasure for me to be able to join this, this wonderful panel. Uh, you're, you're kind enough not to ask us about our targets for um, uh, emissions. Um, and I have to say that there is a, a grave risk of uh, uh, excessive emissions of hot air just across the road uh, at, at the ministerial, but we, we're hoping to put a, a curb on that as well. Um, and indeed, uh, I, I can say that from our senior management down, uh, there's very strong uh, interest, engagement, commitment to working uh, with the, the full breadth of our, our membership, now 166 members, uh, to accelerate and, and support uh, technology diffusion in, in this critical area. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no, no question about that at a, at a policy level and at a very practic, practic, practical level. Uh, that said, we are, a, we are a secretariat of an international organization, so uh, the, the action is in the hands of, hands, hands of our members. But, uh, what I thought I could highlight is uh, some of the analytical and the uh, practical technical assistance programs we, we undertake. Because indeed, uh, your introduction mentioned the importance of a balanced and tailored uh, intellectual property system that is responsive to the distinct 
needs and circumstances of, of individual countries um, and, and not a kind of a top-down uh, template that you simply comply with. And certainly that has been the, the strong tenor of uh, our policy support and technical assistance, particularly for developing countries. Uh, and that, that's why we also partner with uh, uh, other international organisations, so it's not simply one voice or one uh, narrow perspective, if you like, uh, because uh, any solution that we're talking about in this area, whether it's at the general international level or on the ground uh, in individual countries, uh, has to be uh, multifaceted in character, uh, whether it's about um, innovation of new green technologies, whether it's about adaptation and application of existing technologies or or technology diffusion of the kind of wonderful technologies such as carbon capture that we've, we've heard about. Uh, these are very practical tasks and involve m multiple uh, drivers to, to make them work in practice. The balanced IP system and uh, the support for uh, technology transfer arrangements uh, is one of them. Also, in ensuring that there are, there are not obstacles to uh, the, the productive use of the IP system, uh, the role of, um, for instance, competition policy and uh, uh, remedies against uh, restrictive licensing practices and so on. These are all part of the mix, both within the TRIPS, TRIPS framework and in the broader engagement we, we have um, with, with our members. And from that point of view, I, I would say that uh, the, the, the metric of strength of, of IP systems that you mentioned with, I'm, I'm personally sceptical of that, that metric um, on either side of the debate, frankly, because it, it, can, it, it tends to put together so many d distinct uh, factors in terms of an optimal design of a domestic uh, set of policies. And indeed, that, that idea of balance that you've mentioned is a dynamic one uh, and does involve looking both within and beyond the IP system. So that's certainly the approach that, that we, we, we tried to take. Um, we heard throughout the, rightly so, throughout the pandemic that uh, uh, it cannot be business as usual, that, uh, uh, that faced with a, at, this sta at that stage, a, a very urgent crisis, that it, uh, it, we can't simply wait for uh, natural market forces, if you like, to, to, to draw new technologies through and, and disseminate them, uh, that it can't be business as usual. That, that is the attitude that I think has to be really uh, applied to the climate crisis. Uh, and because it's more, the, the effects are real and we are fe all feeling them, but because it's more incremental than the uh, immediate uh, drama of the, uh, of the pandemic, there's a risk that, um, that we do lapse back into business as usual, which simply is not appropriate, whether from a policy point of view, a national program point of view, or for that matter, even uh, a private sector point of view. And that's one clear signal that certainly from our leadership, uh, we, we want to infuse into our, into our dialogue with members. The other point of, uh, point of engagement also is, and these are, as, as you've mentioned, an existential uh, threat. Uh, and uh, just uh, there is, a, if you like, even if you were to be completely self-interested, which I hope, none of the major actors are, you would still want uh, that um, particularly uh, mitigation technology to, to be actively, uh, energetically d uh, disseminated, uh, such as the, the, the carbon capture technology, because if, if it's even in your own self-interest. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so the, the typical zero-sum mentality that unfortunately we seem to be prone to simply cannot apply, even if you were going to be entirely um, self-centred, which I hope we, we can move beyond. Just quickly on the proposal by Ecuador, which is a, a, a very interesting precursor of what we might be able to do uh, in uh, coming months and years. Uh, a decade ago, indeed, Ecuador made a proposal in the TRIPS Council, which is our main body for deliberation of these issues in the WTO. It was quite a... a, a a substantial proposal. It, it proposed, in, in effect, uh, winding back some of the key areas of, uh, in particular, patent protection for uh, what we might call fr climate friendly or green technologies. Uh, and this sparked uh, a very intensive, uh, very valuable 
uh, debate about exactly these questions, how to, how to use the IP system as a policy tool uh, to engender the right kind of you know, incentives for the innovation we want and, uh, and how, how, that, uh, how that technologies can be disseminated, adapted, applied uh, so that the, the real world benefits are taken. And an important part of this was the incredible diversity of approaches that were reported on and discussed. A, remi a reminder that it's not only the formal uh, legal content, if you like, of a patent act of this or that country that matters, but also the, the broader environment for uh, promotion of investment, promotion of public-private partnerships, uh, for uh, ex uh, leveraging public investment in research, uh, and, f and for uh, using other tools uh, such as competition policy to, to promote um, uh, uh, public welfare outcomes. Uh, and and uh, it was interesting at that time because, <laughs> frankly, very few people ever take an interest in the minutes of the WTO TRIPS Council. Rightly so, I might say. They're, they're not a very exciting read. But in this case, there was ex extreme interest, uh, and uh, including from our, our friends in the UNFCCC Secretariat. And we actually literally had to reorganise the whole formatting of these rather normally rather dry documents to, to get that information out because it was... It's proven to be um, very helpful in understanding the full array of policy drivers that are important that are actually being used. So it's not a, not, not, not a theoretical or purely political debate, which we're very good at in Geneva, that's the hot air, um, but, but really practical tools and mechanisms that, so, that, so there's a process of mutual learning. And this was part of the background to the lead up to the Paris, uh, Paris Accord, a, a wonderful outcome. And it's one reason why I think there is more of a positive sum approach to technology management. The, the article that you, you cited, um, there's one factor among very many, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overstate it, uh, but we also, at that time, we had uh, very extensive, with our partners in UNFCCC, with, with WIPO and UNEP, UN Environmental Program, uh, capacity building programs, uh, policy discussions for delegates, for other experts, so that, they, so that we were able to break down some of the conceptual um, barriers between, oh, well, I'm an IP expert or I'm an environmental expert. Um, it, 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 this, this, to me, was the really important outcome, that there was a, a really uh, um, inclusive cross-cutting discussion so that people are able to share their expertise without that single perspective, you know, dominating or people just talking within the same echo chamber. So that, in a nutshell, is, uh, is the experience we've had. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I did ask you to cover a lot of ground, so thank you so much. Um, I think I'd, I, I do want the opportunity for um, you in the audience to be able to ask questions, so I'm just going to ask our panelists to give us um, two policy recommendations, um, something you would recommend for a national government and something you would recommend for the WTO or other, or other uh, international institution. Can, do you want to start, Famida? Sure. Um, sure. Right. Um, so uh, for the government, um, in, as I've mentioned in my uh, previous uh, seg segment, that there are so many policies are in place. But one thing is that the data on um, technology itself broadly, but, and also climate technology. So that, uh, firstly, the generation of data is very important because it's it sets the you know uh, benchmark that where and how much we need and what kind of technology is suitable i mean there are a lot of debates in terms of you know which technology is suitable for which country so it can be one size fits all the other thing is that development part of the technology it has to be also taken into consideration because you see a lot of you know in, um, domestic initiatives are taken by the investors, larger, you know, private sectors, but it is also the issue for the small and medium enterprises for whom finance is a big issue. So access to finance and access to technology, these are intertwined for them. So the public or the, at the national level, those seg segments have to be actually looked into. So internationally, uh, there are the 
technologies uh, in terms of the mitigation energy technologies which I've mentioned already. These are highly also relevant for um, or these are under the jurisdictions of IPI regime and it's going to be more and more and for Bangladesh it is doubly risky because by 2026, Bangladesh is going to be graduated from the LDC category, which makes it more difficult to access those technology at a concessional rate or free. Um, as it is, the technology transfer within the WTO discussions has not happened so far. So I would, um, for the policy, policy recommendations, the international community actually also has to decide on the accessibility of the technology for those countries which are at the initial level. Thank you. Thank you, Famira. Nagesh? Uh, thank you, uh, Rachel. I agree. I think uh, we have no option but to enhance or uh, expand the supply of climate technologies through public-private partnerships, uh, as Anthony said, and uh, public domain uh, technologies. I mean, the Critical technologies like climate technologies have to be in public domain. And my mind goes back to the days of uh, green revolution in India. It was made possible or it was facilitated by the fact that uh, these technologies were in public domain with the CGIAR institutions, so the Consultative Group on International Agriculture Research. And that helped in uh, you know, national agriculture innovation systems too take the bigger lines, adapt them, and, uh, you know, diffuse. Similarly, for climate technologies, we need to expand the supply of uh, public domain technologies, uh, and for that, uh, public-private partnerships, all of that would be very helpful. Also, North-South and South-South partnerships, uh, you know, the countries which are suffering for similar kind of uh, situations, could collaborate, pool their resources, and develop them. Having said that, I mean, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. So some of the technologies which are available already have been invented and are in, not in public domain. How do one get access to them? That is an issue. And uh, there, you know, the uh, proposal of uh, Ecuador, uh, which was there, those kind of things need to be acted upon in the context of, I mean, the planetary crisis that we are talking all about all the time. So uh, creating some kind of peace uh, clause or an exception for climate technologies, you know, would be very helpful. Uh, and, uh, you know, when TRIPS was uh, adopted, one of the objectives of TRIPS was to facilitate and foster transfer of technology. There is an Article 66.2, which was left vague and best endeavor clause uh, kind of thing. So they, it is time to uh, define what would it mean, how would the technology will be transferred. And uh, for developing countries, for LDCs, what could be the uh, kind of uh, differential uh, treatments and all that. Uh, the other thing is uh, to, I mean, we recently hosted uh, the G20 summit in, in New Delhi in September last, and technology issue along with finance did come up for climate change and sustainable development because that was the centerpiece of uh, G20 presidency of India. And a lot of movement on international finance, MDB reforms and all that. There was also a lot of discussion about technology. And uh, India offered its expertise and experiences in uh, di uh, the digital public information uh, infrastructure, uh, including digital finance, direct benefit transfers, universal identity, etc. What is called as India stack. So, India offered that uh, freely to other uh, countries uh, which want to benefit from that. However, the transfer of existing climate technologies, which was referred to, but was still a work in progress. I mean, there wasn't much movement on that. And I think uh, the Brazilian pres presidency and South African presidency, both are members of the Global South, uh, I think they need to drive it forward and get something of a consensus on what 
are we doing with respect to enhancing the supply of uh, climate technologies and what are we doing to enhance or facilitate the access to existing technologies because it would be a, a big uh, mistake to think of reinventing the wheel. I mean, why should uh, re resources after all are limited? Why should we be reinventing the wheel? So what is available should be uh, passed on. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Nagesh. Um, Anthony, two policy recommendations for us? Uh, certainly. One, one would be to, um, to, 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 as has been mentioned, prioritize uh, and clarify uh, technology priorities. Uh, the nationally determined contributions under the, um, the Paris Agreement, the UNFCCC, is a, is a good starting point. And there we see an incredible diversity. Um, and with that comes a diversity of uh, uh, policy choices and, for that matter, investment of public and private resources, whether you know, we're talking about a, a scheme for every village having a solar-powered pump or a major tidal power in installation. And these are incredibly different uh, uh, in terms of everything you can imagine, everything from the investment framework, the dissemination network, the number, the the the, the producers of the technology, the installers of the technology. So we have to accept accept that, and uh, uh, fo focus on workable uh, uh, national and re and regional objectives rather than the idea that there's one um, uh, sort of silver bullet technology that that uh, uh, will trans transform matters. Because the, the need for transformation is so, so deep and, and fundamental, um, it, it's not a matter of um, uh, a fresh technology off the supermarket shelf, in a, in a sense. Uh, the, the second approach is, is to, the second uh, point is, is then to think about what a, what an, uh, if we're talking about the IP system as one component, uh, what, what, a, uh, what that balance that we talk about actually, actually looks like. And I have to say quite frankly that, um, this is a personal view, that the, the suggestion sometimes we see that, well, the best way is to make uh, climate-friendly technologies uh, unpatentable, to, to withdraw or, or to uh, cancel patent protection for, for technologies because they are beneficial to the environment. This, this would have uh, uh, potentially uh, negative effects in that it, it would incentivise uh, climate unfriendly technologies and di di divert resources to those unfriendly technologies and it would create a, a disincentive to license uh, technologies for climate friendly purposes. So consider uh, thermal imagery or G GPS type technologies. Uh, a, a, a patent holder uh, has an incentive then to uh, invest in uh, or to license the technology for deforestation because it, it, it's it's uh, negative for the environment, but not for uh, monitoring uh, the, the, the sustain, sustainable use of, 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 a, of a forest resource. That to me is, it would be very unfortunate because uh, because that if, if you could show that your technology could be used for environmentally friendly purposes, you would then instantly have the penalty of your patent being cancelled. So you know we need to think about that balance in 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 a in a way that. Uh, that promotes uh, in a strong innovation outcomes and also um, encourages the dissemination technology. That said, there are, there are um, measures such as uh, a broader approach to competition policy, uh, an approach to monitoring uh, restrictive um, or burdensome licensing practices uh, that can provide also uh, a, a stick uh, alongside the, the, the carrot to, to promote uh, te technology diffusion. And these should be explored um, uh, mu much more actively with a, with a focus on not just on more narrow ideas of competition policy, but, but the idea of sustainability uh, as, uh, as a goal. Uh, as it ever, I could talk all afternoon about it, but here's some ideas, thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, and this is, this is perfect. We have about 12 minutes to hear from some of you. Um, so I think our... Um, Organizers will have, you have a question, um, have a microphone. So we'll have um, Daniel here, we'll give you a, um, a microphone. We have our first question right here in the second row. Um, we'll take three questions and then, um, and so one, two, and three, and then you'll go in the second round. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think a very useful discussion. 
I was trying to relate to, uh, the discussion to the MC13 outcome hmm. and the decision that will be taken tomorrow. Hopefully, we will come up with, a, hmm. uh, with an outcome document. Uh, Dr. Famide mentioned about the issues of uh, graduating LDCs. So we'll be, uh, uh, you know, uh, not getting the TRIPS uh, facilities and uh, also including pharmaceuticals, TRIPS and pharmaceuticals, uh, beyond 2026 when Bangladesh graduates, for example. So there is a demand from the graduating LDCs, uh, which is, was an outcome of MC12. Uh, Annex 1 was market access, duty-free, quota-free, and Annex 2 had the technology transfer and extension of the TRIPS. Uh, till 2033 for the graduating LDCs as well, uh, and not to discontinue it uh, once they graduate. So uh, I think that uh, that is very important for us. So Nagesh rightly mentioned South-South cooperation and the Indian G20 in that context, but as a deliverable of the uh, WTO, so I think that that is very important that uh, we have a discussion and a decision on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have our second right here. Oh, yes, I okay. should say identify yourself. I okay. forgot to tell you. Would you like yeah, to? My, my name is Mustafizur Rahman. I am from Center for Policy Dialogue, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, is my executive director. Yes, it's, it's <laughs> nice to see you, Mustafizur. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Wen Huaji. I'm a law professor from China's University of International Business and Economics. Uh, indeed, uh, and I think well, thanks for the very informative introduction. And the look at the, today's topic is uh, I, uh, climate technology and IP. Peter or okay, the medicine debate or something new. So first question is goes to medicine debate. We maybe I just briefly in the within the WTO and concerning the uh, public health and IPR has been debated for many years. And recently, last the MS13, MS2012, we have the trips we were. But uh, unfortunately, and uh, the, we, we got the decision, but the decision has not been used by any member, even the proponent member. So the question is, and we talk about this issue, we first about what's the experience and what's the lesson we can get from the, the failure in practice. You, you, don't, you cannot use it. So let's go to the second question. Definitely technology and IPIU will be very important for us to fight the climate change. We need a new technology, new products. But the, we, we, we must see this from two perspectives. First one was for those countries or companies who, which have the technology, have the capacity to develop technology. IPI is important for them because this, uh, they, 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 they rely on the IPR protection to get revenue. But for the many uh, small and enterprises and uh, com members and countries and uh, which um, Naturally speaking, under the lack of the capacity, but in the force, uh, within the forcing uh, uh, um, time, and maybe they don't have the capacity for them. And the the, the problem is that whether they could uh, uh, get the technology and products at a low cost, at a low cost of no cost in both low cost accessible. So I think uh, maybe at this point the IP system could play some role, but cannot solve all the problems. What's the role? IP could play is a trip, another trip to waiver serve that possible, but uh, the medicine, the, the, the trip to waiver on vaccines tell us it's not that easy. So, what might be the new way to based on the, the basic theory of IP protection, also based on the economic benefit? Maybe I think in the future and uh, for the benefit of the whole. Uh, society, uh, the whole world, a kind of uh, collective compensation or collective uh, remuneration system could be used. Okay, for some countries, uh, it's the LDCs, and they could, uh, the IP could be waived for them, but maybe we have some fund to support the, or compensate those companies who suffer the loss, which can reduce the, 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 the resistance from them. So it's, I think we need, a new, new, need some new ideas. I would like to hear the, uh, the, 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 the thoughts from the uh, uh, discount experts in this regard. Thank you. Wonderful. And we have one more question in the back. Um, and then we'll let our panelists speak to these questions. 
Thank you. Monica Rubiolo from Trade Promotion, uh, Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs. Um, I think that the name of the panel really points out the issue that there is a link between uh, climate technology and intellectual property rights. And, and this is the link about innovation. Innovation doesn't happen in a, in a vacuum. Does it need really a, a lot of investment to be done? And what we see in practice in many countries is that this investment is never going to happen if there is no certain level of protection. And I think that many of the, of the issues that were mentioned in the panel, the link not only to greenhouse gas emissions reduction, but in particular to adaptation technology, which are heavily necessary for the developing countries to be able to tackle the challenges of climate change, will not happen if there is not enough incentive for investment to take place. And this is what is missing in many developing context, country contexts. So my question is, uh, in particular, looking at the and uh, hearing at the questions and the requests from many SMEs from developing countries, which when they get to the stage that they can start participating in, in the market, they are looking for IP protection. So they ask for assistance through WIPO and through many of the programs that Switzerland is, is currently financing for assistance in order to protect their innovation. Is there not a disconnect between the discussions that are taking place at the WTO and the real need of SMEs also in developing countries? Great. Uh, great questions. Um, we have, if each of you could speak just a couple minutes or just a minute um, to whichever. You don't all have to speak, but if you have a response, and then we'll try to take another quick round. The last point you have mentioned, I also touched upon uh, that issue that um, the small entrepreneurs, particularly those who are really involved in, I mean, they have to struggle uh, with the climate impact because they are the ones who are most impacted. But on the other hand, they don't have the technology to adapt, I, neither adapt nor, I mean, they don't need to mitigate. But when it comes to business also, like SME businesses, how they're going to have access, because it's, because technology, as I have mentioned, that innovation requires investment, and in, they do not have, you know, a, a, the capacity to inv uh, attract investment, because foreign investors or the pri uh, private investors, they would invest where there are, there are economies of scale. These businesses do not have the economies of scale, but they are part and parcel of the whole you know, supply chain of uh, industrialization or production systems, which needs to be cleaned. So for that, that's why the public sector has to come forward for their you know, support. And in that regard, the IP you know, extension, uh, the waiver is very important, and the extension for, you know, even for countries like Bangladesh, which are going to be graduating um, a post-graduation period also, they should have some flexibility. Thank you. Yeah, I, coming to this uh, question, this is a very long uh, drawn uh, debate whether uh, you know, innovation will not take place in the absence of IPR protection. However, if you look at the history of uh, most of the striking innovations, they were all funded public, uh, by public you know, funding. I mean, the COVID uh, vaccines for which companies took uh, you know, patents, they were all funded by the US government or Indian government or whichever government, uh, you know. Uh, and, and so it is basically converting public funded taxpayer money funded intellectual property into private property. And that is where the issue of, uh, you know, the, the access uh, comes. And I think one has 30 or 40 or 50 years of experience in pharmaceuticals where the innovation has not stopped while some countries, developing countries, were uh, using a generics route to develop affordable alternatives of patented drugs. And that has helped in addressing the HIV AIDS uh, problem completely, more or less completely eradicated. So how much of global welfare has been ensured by adopting a two-track approach to IPRs, 
One, you know, that you collect your monopoly rents in the developed world and allow those who cannot afford, you know, that $20,000 per year of treatment uh, vis a vis $100 of, uh, uh, you know, cost, annual cost of treatment. If uh, the, this trips and public health thing did not happen in 2003 and better sense prevailed and so uh, it all went very well. Imagine the HIV AIDS would be the biggest uh, epidemic even raging today and so we need to see the evidence and uh, I think it is possible to get the objectives without uh, tightening the IPRs. Thank you. Uh, thank you Nagesh. If, Anthony if you have one more minute of comments that would be great. Uh, thank you. Yes. Well, just very quickly, then uh, there there is there are some lessons from the access to medicines debate. Although we should recognise that uh, developing a, a, and disseminating a new vaccine is quite a different task to say installing an offshore wind farm. You know, the 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 the, the, the IP issues, the the development issues, the financing issues, the incentive issues are, are clearly uh, different. And I, I, I would I would. Um, uh, argue for uh, tailored uh, uh, strategic uh, approaches uh, in, in individual countries and, and across regions um, rather than um, hoping for top-down solutions. And I, here, I, while I can't really talk about current discussions uh, over the road, uh, I do find that the concept of, of waiver in itself a little bit confusing. Uh, we should, we, we, we must uh, articulate the policy scope that that countries do have and should use when necessary to override the exclusive effect of patents. I mean, that's, that should not be controversial to say that. It's baked into the system. It's not, a, it's not a product of TRIPS or a reaction to TRIPS. It's baked into the system from its very genesis. And uh, uh, it, for me, it was a little alarming that we have to keep returning to that uh, essential principle again and again. So IP rights are not absolute. If, if there is an overwhelming public interest, then that public interest uh, supervenes over, over in, uh, individual interests uh, in, in the interest of public welfare. And both health and uh, uh, a safer environment are clearly uh, canonical examples of the public interest. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you, all of you. I'm sorry we didn't get to the last question. Um, thankfully, we have some time to gather in the hallway and, and continue these conversations. Um, and I'm grateful again to IAST for hosting us. Have a great afternoon.